Frederick Griffith was a recluse known to few. To these, however, his kindly manner and his devotion to his life job made him a lovable personality. Outside his work, he found pleasure in his winter skiing holidays in the Alps, his walks with his dogs on the Sussex Downs, and the cottage he had built there. So reads the description of Fred Griffith in his obituary. The correspondence and personal belongings one would expect to find of an important scientist were lost during the event of his death. Indeed, as I have searched to find accounts of his life outside of his research, I have uncovered very little of his personal life. Griffith was born on October 3rd, 1879 at Hale-on-Cheshire in Lancashire, England. He attended Liverpool University where he studied medicine, pathology, and epidemiology. He had an older brother, Arthur Stanley Griffith, who also became a physician and microbiologist. Upon graduating, Griffith worked as a physician at the Liverpool Royal Infirmary, after which he was a pathologist at the Thompson Yates Laboratory in Liverpool, a private lab with a focus on comparative pathology, and then later at the Royal Commission on Tuberculosis. In 1910, Griffith received a diploma of public health from Oxford, and a year later was hired by the local government board, which was the supervisory government body whose responsibilities were public health and poverty. In 1914, the UK entered World War I. The military absorbed the LGB and became the Ministry of Health's main laboratory where Griffith would work until he died. Griffith was made an officer and worked on studying pneumococcus pneumonia. It was during this period of his life that Griffith would meet William M. Scott. Scott, a doctor and bacteriologist, and Griffith would become lifelong friends and colleagues. During the years of the war, Griffith and Scott would collect and identify numerous strains of disease in the service of research and treatment. Visitors to Scott and Griffith's lab on Endell Street in Soho described it as just short of appalling and chaotic. Headley Wright, who later wrote Griffith's obituary, noted that those two could do more with a kerosene tin and a primus stove than most men could do with a palace. During the 1920s, the world was still recovering from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic that had killed approximately a third of the world's population. Flu and pneumonia were now the leading causes of death worldwide, and vaccines were being researched in laboratories across the globe. In 1922, Griffith and his team were investigating pneumococcus bacteria in the hope of creating a vaccine. They collected the sputum and lung tissue of infected individuals from all over the world. These samples were meticulously cataloged, cultured, refined, and prepared for study. Two strains, rough and smooth, thus named for the shape and character of the colonies they formed on chocolate agar plates, were of particular interest. Much effort was put into cultivating pure samples of both of these strains for study. By infecting mice, observing their condition, and culturing bacteria from their tissues, Griffith confirmed that the R strains of pneumococcus were benign, whereas the S strains were lethal. Griffith observed occasionally mice injected with the R strain would die prematurely. Upon culturing the blood and tissue of these mice, both strains would develop. After cultivating pure strains of bacteria, Griffith continued to have instances of R strain inoculated mice dying and producing both strains of bacteria. Griffith hypothesized that something residual of the killed S strain was causing the R strains to change. The presence of dead S strain bacteria was somehow modifying the R strain, and so he designed an experiment to test this. He ran as a experiment on four groups of mice. Mice injected with live R strain, mice injected with live S strain, mice injected with dead S strain, and mice injected with a combination of live R and dead S. This table shows the results of a series of tests to determine the heat tolerance of the S strain bacteria. This step was important in that it would ensure that the S strains that were injected into the experimental group would be dead and therefore non-lethal. This table shows the results of injecting a combination of live and killed R strain bacteria. In one group, a single mouse died and S strain was found to have contaminated this culture. The portion of this experiment was repeated six times to ensure that no further mice died of this combination. This is the culmination of Griffith's observations and meticulous collection of data. The majority of mice inoculated with both live R strain and killed S strain died. This is the evidence that the R strain pneumococcus was transforming into a virulent strain. At the time of publication of this experiment in 1928, Griffith identified that there was a transforming principle at work, but he had not identified the means of it. This experiment, however, would later influence those who would identify it. Fred Griffith and William Scott both died in Griffith's house during a Nazi air raid on London in 1941. Their correspondence and personal notes were destroyed with them. They died not knowing that their work would contribute to a better understanding of how life works.